Hello friends, welcome back to another 18th century Scarlet Witch sewing vlog. This week we are going to work on getting the pattern from the book in the Patterns of Fashion Part 1 to the real world, whatever that means. So my plan of attack for the pattern is to use the pattern available in Patterns of Fashion 1 by Janet Arnold. I will be taking uh, the pattern that she has provided in there and trying to make it something that I can use and potentially reuse in my studio for as long as I am sewing historical garments. Okay, so here is my pattern here. And basically what I'm going to do is take a picture of it with my DSLR and upload it to Adobe Illustrator. And what that's gonna, I'm gonna take a picture of just this portion because these are my pattern pieces. So in the back, it gives a lot of instruction on using the patterns in full scale. Now, every pattern in the book is like a different size because it's taken from a different extant garment, obviously. So what my task is going to be is to pull this up into normal size and start measuring the waist and the bust and just some of the basic measurements like the hips with the penne on them and get those close to me in my stays and everything. So I've got that all marked and measured. The grain is indicated by the squared lines on the paper, which is helpful. So basically, this is the grain. So, so this piece here, how it's like that, we wanna cut it like this, same with this. So that means that once this curves up, it will have be like on the bias, which is helpful. This is on the grain, this, and that means that this part here will again be cut on the bias. Also, it tells you in the back that there are no seams allowed and that you have to leave adequate turnings. So we know we need to at least add seam allowances. So that gives us a lot of information on how to use this. Obviously too, it gives you instruction information, instruction, <laughs> it gives you construction information. We're not going to worry about that too much for right this minute. All right, so I have imported my image and now we can open up Adobe Illustrator and start a new project. I did some, I counted the larger squares to figure out about how many inches tall and wide I need it. And that will let me know how many artboards I need. And I need 49 artboards. So I'm going to add 49 artboards, but I'm gonna go over to more settings. And I'm actually gonna up this column to seven. So that'll make it like seven that way. And then seven, like seven across and seven down. Uh, and that should be like large enough for my project. Okay, so once we have our blank piece of art board setup thing, we're gonna go to properties and under properties, there will be ruler and grids that show our grid. So that is what we're gonna do. We can also show our ruler too if we really need to, but uh, like that's dealer's choice. So now we have a grid on our artboards. So let's place our image. And then uh, I'm going to just place it right up at the top here. So I need it to be a little bit bigger. Obviously I want it to line up with my grid. This was as flat as I could get it. I used, <laughs> these are my fabric weights. They are tombstones. I used those to get the page as flat as I possibly could. So now I am going to drop the opacity on this to about 70, 75. Using like holding shift, I will drag and resize this to the size that I need it. If I do not hold shift, you can warp it completely out of control. And well, that's bad news bears. So we just wanna get this to be the size of the square uh, that, so we want it to be one inch by one inch. 
So the squares on the sheet need to be the size of the squares in the artboards. All while making sure that all of my pattern pieces are still on my board. All right, I think I got it. Now I just have to move my piece around so that all the pattern pieces are gonna fit onto the artboard. Sweet, okay, so now what's gonna happen is I am going to digitize these. So if you can see on my artboard, there is a lot of artboard, like a lot of space that doesn't need to be printed. Now I'm gonna go to layers and I'm gonna lock this layer in and I've already started a new layer, but basically I'm gonna start a new layer. And using my pen tool, I'm gonna to draw over all of these pieces. I'm gonna make sure to label them. So this one here at the top says collar. I will type inside of that and write collar. I will make sure that this is this notch is labeled. Same with these dotted lines on this. All of this will get labeled and all that jazz. Editing Casey here. This video was severely lacking a chatty story time segment, and since digitizing this pattern took about two hours, I thought this would be a fun opportunity to tell a story. As some of you might have seen on my Instagram stories, I've been training for a half marathon. My virtual race happens to be this Sunday, and while I have been training, I've also been learning more about running and specifically about women who have kind of changed the face of running, so to say. So today, I'm gonna to tell the story of Katherine Switzer, the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon. It was 1967. Katherine had been training with her coach, Arnie Briggs, he told stories of his 15 Boston Marathon races, and her love for running combined with the stories Briggs shared made her earn to run this race. When she signed up, there were no issues. She signed her name K.V. Switzer, and therefore no one assumed she was a woman. This was just how she signed her name. On race day, she showed up with her hair down, wearing earrings and lipstick. The other racers seemed to treat her fine, not even acknowledging her gender. She wore bib number 261, and when the gun went off, she started the race with her coach Briggs and her then boyfriend Tom Miller running alongside her. At mile two, to everyone's surprise, the race manager of the Boston Marathon, Jock Semple, ran onto the course to try and stop her. With his anger-filled eyes, he ran right at her to rip the bib off of her, shouting, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. Can you imagine being two miles into a 26 mile race and having the race manager attack you? But can you also imagine if he did that with only two miles left? Tom was able to pull him off of her before he could get her bib. At this point, dropping out was not an option. Catherine knew that if she did, that no one would believe women could run distances and deserve to be in the Boston Marathon. Catherine finished the Boston Marathon in four hours and 20 minutes. There were consequences to Catherine's completion of the 1967 Boston Marathon. The Amateur Athletic Union changed its rules to bar women from competing in races against men. In response to Catherine's completion of the race, the Boston Athletic Association director stated, Women can't run in the marathon because the rules forbid it. Unless we have rules, society will be in chaos. If that girl were my daughter, I would spank her. Catherine didn't stop running. In fact, she trained harder and eventually ran in the New York Marathon and placed 59th overall with a time of three hours and seven minutes. Catherine used her influence to campaign to get women into the Boston Marathon and in 1972, the Boston Marathon officially allowed women to register and run in it. And in 2019, there were over 12,000 female finishers. Catherine returned to the Boston Marathon in 2017 and still had a qualification time to run it, 
so on the 50th anniversary of her Boston Marathon, she completed it yet again. I really appreciate learning about the women in our world who have made it possible for us to do as much as we can do today. There are still countries where women are not allowed to run, and I think that as I grow in my running journey, I begin to look at training and even race day as a time with myself, but also a time sending out positive energy to the people in the world who can't run. So that's my story for today. If you are interested in a digital version of this pattern, I have it available on my Patreon in the video tier. It will be exactly as you see it here, so it will be more of a template to work off of rather than an actual pattern to dive right into sewing with, but I hope some people find it helpful in the construction of their writing habits. I have my pattern printed. I created like a little print guide for myself that I have pulled up on my PC so I can just look over and be like, oh yeah, yeah, that goes there. And now I get to tape this all together and hopefully make a mock-up with it. I don't think I'll get around to doing the mock-up until tomorrow because I do have some other things I have to work on today, but I, if I can get this taped and these pieces cut out today, I will be on a great track. So let's do it. Let's do the thing. Um, so hello, I've officially cut out all of the pieces for my mock-up and I think that the next plan of attack is to sew the front and back together and then the sleeves and start doing fittings with the pieces. So like front and back and then like fitting. I guess I could just add everything at the same time. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that second one. We're just gonna put this all together. Sleeves, collar, pieces, no peplum yet, no skirt yet. See how that looks. And then add the skirt pieces and then go from there. She is not held up very well on that dress form. Girl, you're not looking good. <laughs> All right, so today's goal is really to like finalize the mock-up pattern pieces. What am I gonna do? Obviously, I'm not gonna add cuffs. I'm not gonna add pockets. I'm not gonna add buttons. I'm not gonna add all those extra things that terrify the bejesus out of me. No facings, none of it. We are just bare bones, seeing where these fit lines are and being prepared to take these sleeves in because they look massive. Anyway. That's what we're doing today. 
I really want to share this with you because I've never captured it on video before, but my sewing machine tells me when it needs to be cleaned. So if you see that note right there, that's saying, hey girl, it's time to remove the plate and to clean me and give me a good oiling. And I just think that this is such a brilliant feature. And thank you, Janome, for this. So let's talk for a second. I know I'm not wearing all the proper undergarments. I want to do like a formal official fitting in a few, but I have to talk about some decisions that I've made. So for starters, like I know for a 100% fact that I want this to stay open. Like I want to wear this jacket open because I, I've thought a lot about this and I've been going back and forth between styles and I really want the the vest, the vest, <laughs> the waistcoat and the details on the waistcoat to be closed and seen in the front here and then I want the jacket to like rest open, you know, and I want, I'm gonna put more trim on the front. I'm not gonna add buttons to the front. I'm gonna do uh, velvet on the cuffs and the collar, like it suggests in the book. Uh, I've got linen for the sleeves and then silk taffeta for the skirts and the inside, like the, the lining of the skirts and the lining of the, the front and then canvas, obviously, for the facing. I'm also pretty certain that once I add the facing, this will rest pretty naturally. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm just doing cotton and I am doing this out of wool, uh, which is also another reason why I want this to rest open. Um, it's already gonna be a lot of layers. I live in Georgia, it's hot. When I do eventually, like when it does come like the winter again, I'll reconfigure and maybe try to, like, I don't think I'll need it closed ever, basically. It's it's hot. It's a very warm, heavy outfit already so far. So I guess that's where I'm at right now is, like, as it stands, like, this can close. Well, I'm not, I'm not in stays, but, like, this doesn't even close. And my concern with making it close is that then it will look really big when it's worn on me. So I think the next thing I wanna do is just add the skirts, pleat them where they're supposed to be pleated, add them to this, and um, yeah, and then go from there for this mock-up and do an actual fitting with the other undergarments. The other thing is my sleeves are way too big. This is way too big. For the cuff, this is pretty good, but for the actual sleeve, this is pretty disgustingly large. Um, so I'm probably gonna take some off of that. And then it is really quite like baggy in here as well, which like, yes, I need to be able to move, but I think Something that I could do to benefit my movement is add a little bit to this back seam so that, like, so basically I'm going to take out this and make it about a half an inch bigger in the back. Again, I'm hoping that this all will, like, lay properly with wool. Cotton is so thin that, like, it's not going to stay anywhere that I want it to. Um, so... I need to lengthen my sleeves as well because this is so short. I don't know if you can see here, but like this is at least three inches. So I need to lengthen my sleeves by at least three inches. 
the cup is probably going to be fine, the cup size, like, I might make it smaller. Actually, I'll probably take it in the amount I take my sleeve in, and I'm probably going to take an inch off of each side. I like the dart placement. I like the collar placement. Like, I can really start to picture how it's going to look in the front. Again, think of it like it's going to picture. I can really, all right, let's add skirts. editing Casey again. For some reason, I just decided I wasn't going to talk to the camera about this. I think that Toby had a meeting or something, or there was noise happening in our house. But either way, basically what I'm doing is I pinned this front piece together. I'm rethinking the button thing, so I might put buttons down it and just only use some of them. And then here is where I start to make the adjustments on the waist. I mentioned earlier that I really want to take the notes that I, I gave myself from the waistcoat and fix them in the jacket. So I took this part up and I am pinning it to where I want it to go instead of like obviously where it is. Um, in a second, I'm also going to start pinning the front so that that line just looks a little bit cleaner and better. And I think I also, in between these cuts, did the opposite side too, just for symmetry and to see like how is this going to look. And I do eventually adjust the opposite side as well. Something I should note. I didn't do anything different to the sleeves from no shirt and stays and etc to with shirt and stays and these sleeves look fine to me. So all of those notes I said earlier about the sleeves, I'm not going to do them. I'm not going to adjust the sleeves at all because as is they fit pretty okay. One thing that I should have done and didn't do is at least put my underskirt on because you can see in the back that it looks a little flat and it won't look that flat with the skirt on, but I was pretty warm and I really just wanted to get it done. But here you go. This is kind of what it's going to look like. And yeah, this is all inside out. I, I have to do my own fittings, so I put them on inside out. But I'm loving this shape and I am thrilled with getting on to the next one. So now I'm going to take out this dart and then I'm going to lay this front piece down onto my pattern piece with the dart removed and I'm basically going to pin down where I made that adjustment on the hip. I'm going to pin that to the pattern piece and then fold the whole thing over and draw this line here which is going to be the the like where it will be seen on the jacket, I guess. And then I will draw a line a half an inch away for seam allowance. So that's how I made this part different. I did the same on the skirt, and then I also just added notes to the sleeves. Okay, so that's basically the video for this week, the vlog for this week. I am pretty happy with where I'm at with this mock-up and I'm going to do kind of what I always do and make things just slightly larger than I think I need them so that I can take them in if I need them. My only concern moving forward is how stiff it actually is going to be. Something that I am super duper duper like excited about though with the wool and the canvas and all the other fabrics that I'll be using is I'm a lot more confident that it will stay open on its own. I still might have it close at the top part and then like be open at the bottom so I can show off some of this. Like I, I honestly think that I could have the top if I do the buttons, kind of how I did this button, these buttons, if I have them like this in these four spaces and then the rest open, I think that could be really cute and flattering. I also plan to embellish the trim on that one a lot more than I embellished the trim on this coat or on this coat, on this waistcoat. So I have, and I'm going to do a separate kind of like 
set, not set, but I have a different sequin concept that I want to do for the outer one. So yeah. So I think that the next steps are to actually start working on this jacket. I think I want to start with the front panels and kind of just work my way through some of the hand sewing processes. So that's what you'll be able to expect from me in the next vlog on this is cutting and whatever kind of hand sewing stuff I have to do before I can seam up the majority of this jacket. So I know I was saying I'll finish this around April or at the end of April and that obviously isn't the most realistic thing right now but I'm very hopeful that we will get this done in May. I'm very very hopeful. And with that being said my voting tier over on Patreon is voting on the next costume that I'm going to be working on. They are voting between a Rococo Sarah Sanderson and an 1850s Victorian ball gown version of Ariel from The Little Mermaid 2 in her lavender dress. I have materials for both of these costumes and patrons are voting and obviously they're the ones that are going to decide which one I do. But I am kind of curious what your thoughts are on these projects and which of the two that you like the best. I do plan to get around to both of them depending on how long the next one takes is going to kind of depend on what comes after because I also am scheming on that Halloween project. Y'all know, y'all know I'm a schemer and that ideally I would start in August. So if you would like to support my art, head on over to Patreon. Thank you to everyone over on Patreon for all of your love and support. Patreon funds go to funding costumes and making costumes. Actually, the first two months of Patreon funded all of the silk that I bought for the lining of this jacket. So I would just like to say thank you so much for that. And then I would also like to say, if you like this video and if you like my content, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and don't forget to comment below. Tell me what you're working on. Tell me, share on Instagram uh, what you're working on while you watch these videos. I would, I love to see your projects and your work in progress, what you're working on, because y'all know I get inspiration from you guys. I can't just sit here in my studio like by myself without scrolling through Instagram and looking at the things that you're all making. So yeah. That's all for today. Happy sewing. <laughs> What's up? So, hello. Uh, I have officially cut out. Good morning. <laughs> Rococo. The voting tier is Ew, that was so gross. Welcome to another 18th century Scarlet Witch sewing vlog. I don't know what I'm doing with my hands. <laughs> Whatever. Jazz hands. That was last week. Anyway, let's try this again. I don't know what I want to say. Do you know what I want to say? Because I don't know what I want to say. <laughs> Okay. Oh, wow. Okay.